about in it. And it is indeed uh, that time of the year where the spring buds are coming out and uh, every archaeologist working of soul is starting to feel something in the water, <laughs> which is to do with wanting to get out and about and experience the world and the landscape and enjoy it. And so I'm, I'm going to not so much look ahead as to what we've got in store for next season of the site, but think back to last season and some of the cumulative impact of the field that we've been undertaking at Cairns, the site we've been digging down in South Wales, he said, oh, sigh and groan, as I say, since 2006, which was our first field season at Cairns. <coughs> so last year was the 13th season on site, because we weren't on site in 2011. We think we've got another couple of seasons of work to go. And we've got a series of aims and objectives with the project that we'll go into in a little bit more detail shortly. And um, just in case you were in any doubt whatsoever that the technology would work, you know, that the. Ah, it's working, okay. Um, in case you were in any doubt as to the location, there we are. The wonderful British Isles in the far north, the Orcadian Archipelago. We'll see here on the right hand side and the South Ronaldty and down the south east side of South Ronaldty near the Bay of Lennox, starred in that picture is where we're located <coughs> and we're actually not right on the coastline. Anyone who still harbours that idea that, that rocks are exclusively a coastal phenomenon, um, so this will put you right. They're not all on the seashore, this one's about 43 metres above sea level, so it's not terribly high up, but when you're there, poised over the landscape, standing on the site, it actually has a feeling of being much higher up. It has an incredible commanding view across the landscape. You get uh, 360 uh, views, but almost 360 views, across the North Sea and Wind Bay, over to the east, and then over to the south and southwest, over to Scapa Flow. Very commanding, very dominant views. And the other thing, almost as important, I think perhaps even more important in terms of the location of the brock that, that was located on the site, is that you can be readily seen from quite a far distance in that landscape. And that would have been even more the case 2,000 or 2,500 years ago when that building was first constructed, when it was a very high uh, tower-like structure. We're very lucky. Um, we've got a very well-preserved site. We've got lots of three-dimensional archaeology, the kind of thing you come to expect in Orkney, <coughs> really. Um, it's a few years since we've seen brocks excavated in this way in Orkney, where you get an expansive view of the remains themselves, and we've been very um, uh, lucky to have lots of visitors come and see what we've been up to over the summer months over the last few years, and so I very much encourage people to come down again in June and July when we're digging and see it for yourself. And photographs really can't do it justice. I spend the closed season every year from time to time pondering the images and thinking about the archaeology after we've finished the digging. And it kind of gets you into a mindset of thinking, well, that's what the site looks like. And then when you have to get back on site again in the summer and uncover it, and you see these structural remains, it just, it's just awesome. It's just incredible how substantial and monumental the site actually is. There's a whole range of different structures and buildings from different phases. Um, not only do we have three-dimensional archaeology, you can wander around and you get a sense of the, the access and the physicality of what it might have been like to be an inhabitant there 2,000 years ago. But you even get, you know, fully roofed over three-dimensional structures in that sense. So if you're after archaeology of embodiment and inhabitation, you can't get much better than these kinds of northernized data sets in that sense. It's a beautiful landscape as well. Well worth visiting. <coughs> That's our means and objective. I'm not going to go you rigid for those, but we have these three key targets. Every long, complex piece of excavation worth its salt has to have focused targets. We have to have strong research aims. Otherwise, we could just go on digging forever. And actually, sometimes it feels like that's exactly what we're doing anyway, even though we do have very strong research aims and objectives. But number one there is to investigate uh, how that rock was built, its multi phase use and occupation, what the circumstances of its abandonment were, 
um, and uh, to understand the associated contemporary buildings um, in and around that central block. The second one there is we want to understand the relationship between that site and its landscape, so that's the natural landscape throughout the centuries of occupation and use, but also the wider uh, social and built landscape, the whole series of other sites and monuments that exist within that landscape that we're keen to investigate, keen to understand, and keen, therefore keen to put the rock in a wider context. <clears throat> For far too many decades, really almost since the, the first inkling of interest in rocks in Orkney, and indeed in the Northern Isles and the Western Isles, archaeologists have traditionally had a habit of just going straight into these great big mounds of archaeology. It's very tantalising, very attractive because they are great big mounds of archaeology, because it didn't take long at all for antiquaries and archaeologists to figure out that you're really going to get some amazing rewards if you target these big mounds. But what that has had a tendency to do is to isolate drops in the landscape, it's had a tendency to make us think purely in terms of the position of that rock in the landscape. And really, what we want to do at the Cairns is turn this inside out. We, we're well aware of the fact that the, the site is a trap for information about the landscape. The, that information comes in many, many forms, but it gives it leaps out to us all the time. We're not just digging that site, we're digging people's relationships with the landscape two and a half thousand years ago because the tasks, the routines, the journeys, the work that we were involved in came together, was brought together at the site of the Cairns in the Brock and the village that surrounded it. And so we seek to use the site to venture into the wider landscape and understand how folk 2,000 years ago were actually operating across that landscape, cutting peat, reaping harvest, taking the animals from pasture to pasture, quarrying, visiting the neighbours, and yes, maybe sometimes conducting warfare and conflict and extremists. But all these things involve journeys, tasks, and social relationships and relations across the landscape. And that's the, the key thing, I think, that we're trying to get out of the site, break out from the silo of the site and explore its relationship with the landscape itself. And then finally, yeah, just a favour of mine, Subterranean structures, souterrains, and the so called wells from the Iron Age period are things I'm really, really keen and interested in. So, we wanted to explore this site with the hope that we would find some of these sorts of structures and to be able to try and understand them a bit better and a bit more richly um, than they perhaps have a project. Uh, it's actually out of date 13 seasons of excavation, uh, 18 Iron Age buildings that we've excavated wholly or in part over the proceedings. Thousands of artefacts, over 100,000 individually hand recovered pieces of animal bone, and thousands and thousands of environmental samples that we've recovered in order to try and capture an essence of those very relationships with the land that I was just speaking about a moment ago. Uh, it's very rich in artefacts, typical Arcadian, Middle Iron Age to Late Iron Age site, lots and lots of lovely goodies for us to fetishise over, but really there's more to the artefacts than that, of course. Again, they're telling us about people's activities and about their relationships and about their identities as much as they are about their tasks and their work and the things that they did for a living, as it were. So there's pottery, there's stone tools, there's wonderful, wonderful metal uh, preservation conditions as well. So bronze and copper alloy pins and pieces of jewellery and the like are preserved to us very well also. <coughs> and of course, we've also got things like stone tools of one kind or another coarse stone tools, spindle whirls for textile production, lots of pottery um, for us to uh, get our teeth into and do a kind of analytical work with that and see what people have been eating, how they've been cooking, how they've been processing food, how they've been storing it. All really important dimensions of, I suppose, the subsistence strategies of these communities. The community of farmers who lived and worked over many centuries at the Cairns. Bone artifacts like these wonderful uh, long-handled weaving combs used on looms. We've recently been able to prove through experimental work and the application of one of our wonderful master students at the Archaeology Institute. <coughs> one of the really interesting things about the site <coughs> that we can do today with the, the wonders of modern archaeology is look at the site both in terms of the macro scale of things and the micro scale of things. 
actually important for us because for many long years, lots of dimensions of what we could call the archaeological record were, were not taken up, they weren't utilised to their full capacity. And it's only really with the advent of modern scientific and analytical techniques that we were more able to really get to grips uh, with some of these objects. So the big stuff is in your face, so the Brock itself, as you can see there, it's quite a monumental structure, very large building. There's muggins there, can you see me? That gives a sense of scale. That's me on the staircase in the wall thickness of the Brock, so it gives you a sense of the, the sheer scale of the building, the central Brock building. And at the micro level, um, from those soil samples, we sift and sieve and sort literally millions probably of tiny pieces of bone, fish bone, uh, microfauna in the form of mice and voles and other little rodents that have been uh, making quite a nice little living, thank you very much, in the, the human waste products of the Brock inhabitants themselves. And then things like this, just as an example, lovely little objects and artifacts, an array of glass beads most of which have uh, beautiful colours and patterns and were, would have been worn as very distinctive items. Um, we wish we could say more about how they were worn, but it's difficult because where the dead are in Iron Age Orkney, and indeed in Iron Age Scotland, for the most part, is a bit of a mystery. We don't find very uh, obvious uh, remains of cemeteries in funerary archaeology, and so it's difficult to be sure in the absence of lovely formally set out mm. graves, how personal items like jewellery, beads, metal work would have been worn on the body. And that's where the kind of microanalysis can come in actually. Um, so here's a, a particular type of bead, it's a, a dumbbell bead. And again, one of our undergraduate students just last week was puzzling over this object um, for a piece of a small project work that he's engaged in at the moment. Um, and Gary contacted Fraser Hunter and the National Museum and between the two of them, Having a discussion about it, it seems it's one of these things shown in the centre there. A little dumbbell bead, a glass toggle bead. Now that's all well and good. It's lovely to get these little flashes of colour and beauty. And they give us an inspiring sense of how people attempted to present themselves and their identities to each other and the wider world. But things like this, when you look at it under a microscope, really interesting. So I won't bore you with the details. I wish I had a video of clackers, because that would really explain what's going on here. Does anyone remember clackers from the 70s and 60s? Yeah. Well, when clackers hit each other, they do a thing called Hertzian contact. So it's when two spherical bodies of a certain mass hit against each other. They create these funny little half moon shapes, these little C shapes. Now, this is microscopic. You can't see this with, with a human eye under normal conditions when you look at the bead. But when you look at it under a microscope like this, you can see that wear, or at least I hope you can make out that wear. Now we know it's wear, and not just a product of the manufacturing glass bead, because, I don't know if you can make this out, but you see this funny, this funny groove, this little shallow gully coming right round right here. That's the impression from the metal tongs, the iron tongs that were used to hold this glass when it was uh, very hot indeed, to hold it, to control it while we're manufacturing that dumbbell shape. And if you notice, down this corner of that impression, that gully, our little C-shaped marks have eroded the tongs. Oh, by the way, did everyone get the Glaswegian cultural reference at the top of the title? Good stuff. <laughs> I was hoping you would. Um, so what you've got here is wear that's cut across the original manufacturing uh, evidence, and that's telling us that that wear is actually happening during the life of the beat, um, the use life of that beat. Now, the, the important thing about that, about this Hertzian contact point detail, which hasn't really been noted in glass iron age beads before, is that when it's been noted in other parts of the world, the beads are used in really extravagant gestures. You have to be doing something really quite extravagant with high energy in order to create this wear. So we're talking about things like dance, we're talking about jumping, we're talking about very energetic agricultural labour, that sort of thing repetitively happening. And it leaves these thousands and thousands of little contact points. But that's really, really important because A, what it's telling us is these single beads that we recover archaeologically randomly across the site are often strung together in necklaces, which you might have intuitively thought might be the case, but we don't really have any evidence for that. 
And then secondly, it's telling us about a range of bodily positions that people 2,000 years ago might have taken up. And things like their cultural lives, their social lives involved in dance and extravagant gestures, you know, and the kinds of things that you might see in ethnographic footage of the Maasai with their elaborate dances and involved in rites of passage and initiations and ceremonies and that kind of thing. Is it actually literally possible that we can see microscopic evidence of that kind of activity, writ large or rather writ small in these little glass beads? It's something for us to work on, so we're going to be doing some scanning electron microscopy over the next uh, year or so to bring this out to map this detail and really see what's giving rise to it. And we're going to do some experimental work as well, so if anyone wants to join us in a little dance whilst you're wearing lots of glass objects hanging from your body, then you're as mad as we are, but you're very welcome to join us. But what, after that bit of an introduction effectively to, the, to something on the side, what I really want to talk to you about are Brocks and beyond. I want to talk a tiny bit about Brocks, and then I want to go beyond Brocks. Now, I've borrowed the title, slightly paraphrased it from a book from the, the late 1980s, edited by a great Brock scholar himself, Ian Armit. Um, and it was called Beyond the Brocks. And the theme of that book was really to look in the age that came after the Brocks, still within the Iron Age, but in the post-Brock period, and to see what legacy and inheritance these great middle Iron Age communities, the Brock builders, had to pass on to their descendants. You know, I'm talking about into the Pictish period and the like. <coughs> So I want to talk about beyond the Brock chronologically in that sense. I also want to talk about beyond the Brock physically in the landscape sense as well. But first of all, a little bit of little bit on Brocks, because they are a lovely thing to contemplate. So one of the great things about our Brock is that <coughs> it's really well preserved. It's given us some really good direct evidence of the, the layout of the interior of the Brock. So we've been able to um, map out Oh, it's not as clear as I would like it, but we're able to map out the orthostatic compartments and divisions inside the broch that would have governed the directions and movements that people were able to take up and move around and circulate within the rooms and the interior, at least the ground floor of that broch space. Um, so you came in the entrance, here, just south of east. It's kind of facing onto the autumnal equinox, if that's significant, perhaps. In through an inner entrance passageway, so there's a further <coughs> corridor that you uh, were channeled into as you entered the drop. You had a variety of options thereafter, but if you, if you parked around to the left, to the south, you found yourself in the south room. Or you could branch off into a southeast room, where in the late 1st and mid 2nd century AD there was a hearth set up within that room. And then from there you could access two further chambers set within the wall. We call them the red cell and the yellow cell because each of them was completely plastered with uh, red and yellow clay respectively. From the south room you could enter the intramural staircase <coughs> and wind your way up. Within the thickness of the wall of the broch and almost certainly sp uh, spill yourself back out again above the ground floor into a first floor, um, probably a whole, root, uh, a whole uh, floored apartment above, and probably another one above that. So really substantial floor space, really quite large houses, probably housing quite a large number of people in of themselves, never mind the fairly extensive settlement <coughs> network round about them. You could also go into the central room where there was no hearth, unusually, for a brock. So a brock is a bit unusual, at least in this phase. Or you could move into the west room, or the west wing, uh, where there was another hearth. So effectively, there's a kind of binary uh, at work within inside the brock. In this phase, we call it phase 3B, which involves a hearth, of, a hearth in each of the west and the big southeast rooms. And those hearths are relatively similar size, and there's no central <coughs> path. And it looks like there's quite a complex arrangement and division of space internally inside that broth. And that's quite different from what have been traditionally noted in 
rock excavations like the wonderful excavations at the Howe outside Strumness in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, or other sites, early, early Iron Age, thick wall ground houses like the Boo, again, near Strumness. So there's something a little bit different going on in the Brock at the Cairns. You could go into the North Room, where you could wind your way around and find yourself at the opening into the underground structure and descend down in an anti-clockwise direction, down below the Brock, um, two metres below the ground floor into an underground chamber. More on that in just a moment. So we're very lucky. We've got a kind of complete floor plan of the way in which that brock, uh, the architecture inside it governed movement, at least in that phase. One of the things we have to be aware of is the fact that this could very well be just a, a secondary phase, refurnished and refurbished internally. And certainly a number of archaeologists have suggested that that's exactly what you tend to get, is that in the original manifestation you may have a central, round, a central hearth with a large open area, circular concentric area around that half, and a series of radial partitions or divisions around the periphery of the interior. And that's the kind of general logic of the space. And for my money, that's a very sympathetic layout if you're living in the round, as it were, if you're living in a round house. Um, that's a big different sort of space to occupy from a kind of rectilinear, rectangular building, the kind of boxy shapes that that these days we're actually quite familiar with and more used to in terms of rooms. And this way of demarcating the space is a little bit less effective and maybe a little bit ergonomically less efficient than that basic concentricity and radiality that you get with a <coughs> central hearth and a big open area and bays around the side. Having said that, if you notice, can you see the little green partitions around the edge? We're suggesting that those might be the remnants of the earlier phase when it did have that more concentric and radial layout. And quite possibly we'll get to those in the next season or two of excavations outside. Here we are. I should have made that series of footprints padding around. Now, the other important thing, never mind the solid architecture, well, that's really important, but it's the kind of thing that archaeologists have noted from time immemorial during their excavations. But the other thing that's really important is we've got really good floor preservation. So the soft stuff, the lovely, unctuous, greasy floor deposits, the human filth that is the waste products and the detritus left behind by the inhabitants of that rock. And for us, of course, as archaeologists, that's manna from heaven because it's the, the rich soup of day-to-day -day life building up inside these structures. And we're very lucky, in a sense, Maybe, we're, maybe uh, it's brought about by their misfortune because of the particular location they built the brock and because of the slope it was on, it seems like they had problems with drainage from early on. And instead of doing the usual thing that's been noted in brock sites like Scalloway and Shetland of shoveling out the filth and the floor waste as it became a bit old and jaded and tipping it out into buyers and fields to manure the fields, what it looks like they're doing at the Cairns instead is they're building themselves up. So we've got at least half a metre of floor deposit built up inside the rock, possibly more. And there's maybe, there may be as many as a dozen floor deposits within that that we can see with the human eye. And there may be hundreds in terms of the microscopic evaluation of those floor deposits. And it seems to be that because conditions are a bit damp down there from quite early on, instead of shoveling out the waste, they've just built up and built up and built up and built up. So their misfortune may well be our gain because it means that we have a complete sweep of the floor deposits from the get-go, from stage one of the occupation of the brought through to the very end. And for us again, that's an incredibly lucky set of circumstances and these are some of those floors there. And there's Joe McKenzie, a micromorphologist, busy at work, um, scouring the floor and taking samples, taking solid, um, secure samples from those floors in order to look at them microscopically and tell us lots of information about how they were building up. Um, we seem to have lots of episodes where they lay down clean yellow clay and then, they, and then they're living on it and the living waste is a sort of black, organic, very rich, greasy substance. But then after a while they lay down some more yellow clay and then they start again and then it's more greasy, black, organic stuff, which is the rotted down 
vegetation, probably from bedding, from flooring, straw and that kind of thing. It traps artefacts, it traps environmental remains, it traps little mice and voles and all sorts of other things um, in its matrix also. And you get a sense of these lovely, beautiful, vivid, colourful uh, lenses of floor deposits based on um, uh, the build-up in these, these uh, structures so you can see in this really reds and browns and black detail. And of course those floors are also very rich in artefacts, so we've got things like lovely bone objects. This is possibly a handle from a bow drill um, that's made out of a piece of red deer antler. And there's loads and loads of objects that are coming out. And so what we're doing is we're charting and mapping through time the distribution of the objects across the surface of the Brock interior. And we're also recovering the environmental remains and we're recovering the chemical signatures from those floor deposits. So we're mapping and charting out the activity areas around the Brock to understand who was doing what, where and when through the life of the Brock. At least that's the theory. Um, we'll get a lot of good information out of it. What we won't ever really fully understand is how much information we're missing. It never, built, never found its way into these trapped floor deposits in that sense. And of course it involves thousands of these things. Um, big ice cream tubs that we fill with uh, litres and litres of soil <coughs> deposits. They get served and sorted and looked at and all the lovely little detritus comes off of that for us to have a look at in terms of micro artefacts and the like. Um, but one of the things I just want to move on to talk about, one of the things that's always really appealing to me is these underground structures and I mentioned the so-called well underneath the floor of the rock. It's something we found a couple of years ago. Uh, we didn't really do any work on it until last season uh, where we fully excavated it. We had hopes that it would allow us to get an insight into the environment, that it might well be again a trap for even more exceptional environmental remains. We didn't have a clue how rich and how lovely that would actually turn out to be. Um, here's the so here's the well. Oops. Here's the well on the right hand side here looking down into it. You get a sense of those stairs uh, descending down, seven stone stairs leading down into a rock cut chamber underneath the floor of the building. And here's the, the position of that in the Brock, so it's the far north interior of the Brock itself. It's a picture of those lovely stairs once we'd cleaned them up. It's amazing to think that we were the first people to tread those stone steps for you know, since the, the mid second century AD or thereabouts. Quite incredible. And as we were excavating the, the silty fills, very wet conditions, we became aware that we were dealing with anaerobic conditions. So uh, oxygen had been purged from these silty deposits. They'd been capped in a thick grey sludgy silt, uh, which sealed some of the lower deposits in the base of that well type structure. So we were getting twigs and branches and bits of bark and leaves and all sorts of things that looked as fresh as a daisy. They didn't smell as fresh as a daisy, but they looked as fresh as a daisy. And so that was a sort of first hint and indication that maybe we could get some really good stuff out of this. And then it wasn't long before we had this little uh, artefact, carved wooden peg, almost like a tent peg. <coughs> and it was found kind of rammed in to the to the silty deposits and the kind of in, the, the kind of rushes and other um, uh, vegetational material that was sat at the lower in the well, as if it was pinning those down into place. And others might have other ideas, but I kind of think this is a sort of filter, a kind of filtration system where they're capturing the silt at the base of the well and making sure that the water above that is relatively fresh and clear and clean. And this is trapping <coughs> all those silts. And then, well, then we really got the shock of our lives because it wasn't long before we started to see small pieces of a, a large organic object, a large wooden object. And it's this wooden bowl. And I don't know if you can see, you probably can't quite see, but it's in this position here. You can just about see the rim there. And another piece of that coming round. Where pieces of it came free or were loose, and we were able to clean them up and marvel at them for two minutes before we had to get them into, into water and get them protected and, and keep them chilled so that the wood would be protected. And then this rather unprepossessing lump is what that resolved into when we lifted it. We tried to rotate it in a soil block. We tried to keep it 
safe and secure and covered in its own silty filth so that would more easily, we hoped, be preservable and something we could um, conserve and stabilise and understand. Got in a crate, got into a fridge, still mucky and filthy. Dr Scott Timpany from the Archaeology Institute was able to take a tiny, tiny fragment of it and look at it under a microscope and tell us even during the excavation that it was from an alder tree. Um, so quite a large vessel. And it does make you wonder, was that really growing in Orkney 2,000 years ago? Um, and we're not really sure on that. And there might be some interesting research to follow up in terms of trying to figure out whether this object was an import and brought into Orkney or whether uh, it was, in fact, homegrown in that sense. The peg was um, a different wood type altogether. It was willow. So you can see the difference under the micro slicer between the alder and the willow. So it's interesting we were getting objects that evoked wetland environments. So you can imagine alder and willow both going in close proximity to sort of wet edges of lochy, boggy kind of wetland environments, wet woodland in that sense. And a lot of the plant material, the lots of the other bracken and sphagnum moss and other materials also kind of evoke that kind of wetland environment. And there's a bog just at the very foot of the hill, which we know that they were in cutting peat 2,000 years ago and finding bog ore that they used to smelt to make iron and the like. So we know that that's, we know that they're very much in, in touch with that environment 2,000 years ago. Went off to the conservators and AOC, AOC uh, a unit based in Edinburgh who specialise in conservation and even more so in wood conservation. This is then working on the bowl. That's the bowl seen from above once they'd excavated it. So it's a lovely, lovely object, or most of the bowl at any rate. There's another view of it. Beautiful pot bellied kind of. Um, vessel, uh, quite exaggerated kind of sides and then lovely carinated, uh, that's to say, uh, <coughs> shouldered sides and then a lovely averted rim, a lovely kind of outswinging rim. And then the surprise, or one surprise for us was that it had a handle, long gone it would seem, but it had had a handle originally, and a little decorative, a decorative rindle or panel that sat around that handle. So this was a handled object, we think it would have been too heavy when full of liquid on the line to actually have conveniently used that handle. So maybe more likely that handle was used for hanging it or suspending it um, away when it wasn't in use. And then the other thing that was really surprising too is a really eye-opener and really, really, really exciting is that the bowl had been repaired, not once, not twice, not three times, but four times using a variety of different means. Um, one of those means was these wiggly rivets, quite exceptional uh, rivets. I'll show you a close-up of them. Uh, little corrugated or wiggly rivets, 16 of them have been tapped in to close a gap and keep that bowl tight and shut together, quite right close together. So that's these wiggly fellows here, made from copper alloy. Um, and glue had been applied partly as well. So this yellowy substance over here is some kind of glue or sealant applied to the outside, presumably to keep it watertight. It's one thing to knit it together with metal clamps, be another thing to keep it actually uh, non-porous. So it looks like they've been applying a sealant or a glue on the outside too. Um, just by way of a, a, a quick digression, the only other sort of um, tradition of wooden bowls that you can identify <coughs> are with this kind of repair work on them, a really sort of 19th century bowl seen in North Africa amongst the Tuareg. And that's one of them here. You can see the same wiggly rivets. And I'm not for a minute suggesting there's any cultural association or throughput between the Iron Age here in Orkney and 19th century Tuareg. But I think it is interesting to note that these round bottom bowls at the Tuareg use were fundamentally women's possessions. They were used in tents, they were used for hospitality. They were also used for apparently quite banal matters like milking goats and camels and the like. But actually, that was very important because that milk was often offered out in hospitality from hand to hand around a Bedouin tent or a Tuareg tent. And these Tazawak bowls, as they're called, were held in great renown. They were passed on from generation to generation. And so often they required these repairs because they were heirloom pieces that denoted lineage and belonging to particular families and clans. So whilst I don't think anything like the detail could be reasonably supposed to exist in terms of our own bowl from the Cairns, 
I do think the special nature of that bill, repaired endlessly over its lifespan, suggests it was a, an important object, maybe even a, you know, a relic of the, of the clan, the family, the group, whatever. Closer to home, Scottish parallels are 16 of these bulls from Scotland and Northern Ireland <coughs> of a, an approximately similar date, 1st and 2nd century AD. The Cairns bull is the largest out of them all, 24 centimetres across the midriff. Uh, the other bulls from Northern Ireland and Western Scotland, places like Skye, like these two bulls here, uh, were all found in peat bogs, every single one of them. So the Cairns bull is the only one that's ever been found in an archaeological context. Although I do think it's suggestive and interesting that the conditions within which we found it almost mirrored and replicated the conditions you would expect in a peat bog. So again, that watery subsurface, that marginal, <coughs> that marginal set of plants and landforms that are evoked inside the base of that well. I'll go no further with that for now. Another surprise for us is that the, the bowl being looked at by conservators in the National Museum of Scot uh, in AOC was taken to the National Museum of Scotland um, for them to have a look at the rivets and lo and behold, they found some more of these, these rivets. I think you can see them, hopefully you can make them out. There's one, two, three. These rivets are currently down in the National Museum of Scotland where they're being looked at by specialists there who are working on the Minehow publication. So these rivets are from Minehow in East Mainland, that very well-known site that was excavated in the early 2000s. So we're going to do XRF work, we're going to do the chemical analysis of the rivets from our bowl and these rivets and see if the copper alloys are similar or different to each other to get a sense of whether it's just possible that they stem from the same workshop. So characteristic and fairly, um, fairly unique are these styles of rivets in an Atlantic Iron Age Scottish <coughs> um, context. And we just had the radiocarbon date back for the bowl, so it's first or second century AD. So it very much matches what we expected it to come out at. That's the death of the tree that was used to make the bowl. But if you look at the centre point, it's a game that archaeologists usually don't play because it's a bit too speculative. But if you look at the statistical centre point of the date, it's about 40 years or so earlier than the centre points of the radiocarbon date that comes in the same period of deposit for the sealing of the well. In other words, it's just about possible that we're looking at the longevity of the bowl there. Maybe it's 40, 50 years old, something like that, at the point in time it goes in the ground. And that would, I think that would be quite commensurate with the kind of level of repair work that's happened to it. There's a final drawing of it, <coughs> line illustration, showing the, the way we do it. And also the clamp on another break point on the, the rim of the vessel. And there are two staples in it as well and another area over the other side of the bowl with these same wiggly rivets, so it's quite phenomenal. And also from the well, uh, if you can see that, funny little filaments, tiny little uh, threads, as it were, actually uh, what turned out to be human hair coming out of the well. Um, strands, strands of it, I think about 30 odd strands that we've recovered so far. These human hair fibres have been identified by colleagues in Aberdeen University <coughs> as A, definitively hair, and B, not belonging to the same person, in fact. So there, there's at least two individuals, maybe more, represented by the hairs. They're cut close to the roots, and they're cut towards the end. They vary in length from between about 7 to 10 centimetres and 10 to 12 centimetres in length. They therefore <coughs> represent about seven months to 12 months of human hair growth. And because hair is incremental in its growth, it lays down traces of diet, toxins, health, disease, alcohol, drugs, pathologies, all sorts of substances and effects, pollutions, um, so the presence of heavy metals that you would expect if there's lots of metal working going on close by. All of that should be writ large within the hair. They'll be taking incremental samples out of each strand and looking at them centimetre by centimetre, we can build up a biography of the last 12 months or so of a, a, human, a human life before it was cut and for some reason apparently placed within the well. One of our individuals has got quite coarse hair. He's got dark, coarse hair. 
to the point where it knocks like that. So it's a little bit matted. One of them well, hey, is, is red hair. Uh, has a, a, a gingery complexion, which I think is great. And again, all of them appear to be cut at both ends. Now, you have to go with me on this one, but when you look around the world at lots of different traditional societies and you see hair cutting at work, very often it's not just a trip to the barber that's involved. Particularly when it's communal, and particularly when that hair is placed somewhere particular and special, what it usually equates to is one of two or three things. Either rites of passage, where people depile, they cut their hair, they shave themselves, they cut themselves, they scarify, they tattoo, they bloodlet, they circumcise, they do all sorts of things that mark out important stages in the human life cycle within their communities. Or the other way in which hair and nails and things are used is for magic purposes. So when you have to cut your hair, you squirrel them away, you secure them somewhere safe, in case somebody gets hold of them and performs sympathetic magic with them, which isn't sympathetic at all, in fact it's very hostile. You use a part of a person to reflect the whole and by doing some harm to the part of the person, you do some harm to the whole of the person. So sorcery, witchcraft, that kind of thing, very, very often seen in ethnographic accounts and records of traditional societies around the world. Hair seems to be a particular thing in almost every society, hair and nails in particular. So I won't venture any further than that, but I do think there's something particularly special going on involving this bowl, involving that hair, Involving, involving the underground place, and I do think it quite likely rites of passage are involved in that. I don't doubt for a minute the well is a well in the sense of lifting out water, but I would suggest that that water is not for feeding the community or, or, or uh, hydrating the community or the animals. There's not enough water in there for that purpose. It's special water for special purposes, I would suggest humbly. Okay, beyond the rocks, the landscape. I made much of the landscape at the beginning. And it is really important, and it is fascinating. It's been wonderful to be able to break out of the rock in the years that we've been excavating the site and to do landscape work. So here's the geophysics, and in the centre there, that's the rock hooked around with that green uh, halo. And <coughs> it's wonderful because the geophysics and uh, trial trenching that we've done across the landscape has brought out other dimensions of what's going on in that landscape. So for instance, down oh, up there, Looking very thick. Can you see that? Purple halo, purple haze, maybe, up there at the top. That's a Neolithic settlement that we've been able to trial trench and, and uh, substantiate that there. That's uh, probably a Bronze Age settlement over here. A collection of about 11 or so roundhouses or double roundhouses, probably Bronze Age. We also think or hope maybe more than anything that that runs into the early Iron Age as well and might well be the direct forebear community to the Brock or one of the direct forebear communities to the Brock. There's a linear feature that runs off of the Brock front door <coughs> which we've been able to travel down, which seems to be a drove route that they would have taken the animals down the hill past the ripening crops in the arable infield around the Brock and spill those animals out into the lower pastures below safely away from the crops. That's what that looks like that linear features do in, in excavation, it seemed like a hollow way, a sunken track that runs up to the front door. Really interesting, quite unique. Quarries either side, which are clearly earlier than the ridge and furrow cultivation, which is the pre-improvement ridge and furrow um, agriculture. We don't know how earlier. We're going to test pit those next month. And we may even find that they're prehistoric, that these may even be the stone quarries or some of the stone quarries used to actually construct the site, the rock itself. Well, to have here, okay, well, I'll renew my efforts. And then further afield, just to complete that landscape picture, uh, we've got Bronze Age features, so as well as that Bronze Age settlement, we've also got Bronze Age burnt mounds in the vicinity. Um, and even a volcano, would you believe, which we had high hopes for last year when we, uh, we surveyed that and we tried uh, trenched it. Turns out to be a volcanic mass that's risen up uh, many millions of years ago and is not archaeological. But the interesting thing is that you get resources in and around these volcanic extrusions that people 
in the Iron Age, before the Iron Age and after the Iron Age, you might well have been interested in. So you get galena, you get lead ore, and you'll get copper sources there as well. So it may yet be that that is, although it's a natural feature, a geological feature, it may still be somewhere that people utilised in terms of uh, the resources and the raw materials for making metal and the like. And then we've a previously excavated early Iron Age site, we've no doubt about that one, the site of Winnet that we excavated back in 2003 to 2005. A souterrain, another underground structure with a house above it. And again, that early Iron Age structure there is maybe another one of the ancestor communities, the origin house for the Broch community itself. And that is one of the things we're interested in doing with this landscape, is understanding how the Broch came about. And to understand Brochs, archaeologists have traditionally looked at Brochs. It's maybe not surprising, it's quite a sensible, logical thing to do. But if you want to understand the conditions that gave rise to Brochs, don't dig Brochs. Look at the things that came before them. What is it that's happening before Brochs, immediately before them and, and longer ago, that actually gives rise to the social economic, political, or other conditions that gave rise to the Brocks themselves. One of the things around the Brock, it's not in the wider landscape, but one of the things that we're very interested in is the villages. There's been a traditional debate, a controversy no less about them, with some people saying that the villages that you find around the Brocks, like you get at the Brock of Gunness, are a bit later than the foundation of the Brock themselves, that they are in fact a secondary settlement, and that were not part of the original plan, that the Broch event originally stood isolated, as they often do in the Western Isles, and that only later on did the settlement accrue around the outside of the Broch. So that's an active debate, and we've got to say, well, what can we do to contribute to this debate? Can we help resolve this question? Because other, other scholars say, no, no, not a bit of it. The villages were built as planned entities, at least in their original form, were built as planned entities with the Brochs. So how do we track through that? How do we understand that? Here's, a, here's an imaginative reconstruction of the Brock of Gunness just to get us thinking and get you to uh, understand the sort of look of some of these things. The, the Brock is almost certainly wrong here, but don't worry about that. The idea of this complex village round about it is the thing that we're getting at. Here's some plans of them, other sites not me. Gunness, Lindro excavated in the 19th century, Howe and mid <coughs> to give you that sense. Well, we've got an extramural complex at Cairns. We have loads of buildings around our Brock at Cairns. Some of them are late Iron Age and post date the Brock. Several of them appear to be contemporary with the, at least part of the life of the Brock. And what we want to establish is how contemporary were they? Were they built from the outset? Here's a plan of the Brock. Oh, that's come very faint. That's a shame. We're losing a bit of detail. But nevertheless, we've got a big central Brock. You've got a number of buildings around it. Structure J here, structure O, structure Q, part of structure K, and the buildings up there, structure M, appear to be part of the extramural complex that goes at least in part with the time of the, the use life of the bra. Here's a view of one of those, structure O itself. And again, struck of uh, uh, luckiness. The, the impact on us, we get a, a, a good fortune with this site. Everything we ever asked for comes to be at this site. It just keeps giving and giving and giving. I mentioned that business of the Brock being built on a hill slope. And because it was constructed on a slope, they cut into the hillside and terraced in, created a terrace. They must have moved hundreds of tons of clay, earth, and boulders in order to create this level platform upon which to plant the Brock. And because they've done that on a 1 in 20 slope, the gradient is such that um, the, uh, there's over 2 metres of depth at the upslope side that the Brock is sat down into. And then it shallows out towards the front. And because of that, uh, we can see the construction circumstances of that Brock. We can see that terrace. We found that construction terrace. So on this side, we were then you can just see that grey arc, that grey-brown arc here. That's, that's the inner depth that surrounds the rock at site itself. Then there's a pale clay, probably the eye of faith now I'm saying that, so it's nice on my screen. Not much good to the rest of you. And then on the inside of it, there's another cut. And that cut is not the ditch, it's not a ditch. 
It's the terrace for the construction of the broth. And over the years of the occupation of the site, that's been filled up with soil and detritus and rubble, which we've been busy excavating. But underneath that rubble and soil that sat within that cut is a narrow segment of the extramural complex, the village that surrounds the broth. And so, our logic is this. If they're cutting that terrace, why would they cut it wide enough to have a space to insert buildings and houses into it from the outset? But not build there, not do that building, not have that village there. Would they really say to themselves, let's make the terrace so wide that in a few generations we'll come along and we can build other buildings in there if we want to? What it, what it seems to be telling us is quite the contrary, that they're actually building a terrace cut so wide in that hillside that they can accommodate the buildings that they need and they want there and then at that moment in time. So when we get radiocarbon dates back from this, we might eventually actually be able to, to track the nut of this debate, this controversy over whether the villages are contemporary. But why does it matter? Well, brocks are phenomenal in any case. The, depending on the estimate that you make, there's between 70 and 120 of them in Orkney alone, 500 of them across Scotland, um, 200 in Shetland, about 300 odd in Caithness and Sutherland. That episode of monumental building requires incredible societal energy to affect in of itself. But if you add to that the fact that many of these broad communities actually had planned villages built from the outset around them, then the phenomenon of the brocks actually becomes even more substantial. In terms of social change, in terms of change in the landscape, the economy, society and politics, that's an even bigger sea change than it would have been alone just from the 500 or so brocks. So that's why it's important to understand whether or not these village communities are established from the outset and contemporary with the brocks. Just another view, another aerial view of that, that cut and that terrace, so I don't think it's showing so well in this picture. Uh, front of the rock, the ditch around the rock, you get a nice clear view of it here. And around the front, it splits and bifurcates into multiples, and we can just about see that in the lower field. Um, the other side of the field boundary, so it's a complex series of earthworks and ditches around the front, so it's an even more imposing uh, presence uh, for a visitor or somebody coming up the hill to visit that site. Um, and that ditched enclosure is very much contemporary with the rock. The ditch system itself is something that we can tell stratigraphically is something that would have went in tandem with the construction of the rock. So again, why is it including such a large space? If, it, if we're to think of that as an empty space for generations before they build that village, it just doesn't make sense in my view. And there's a profile of that ditch there. Okay, moving swiftly on, the later Iron Age. Um, we've got, first of all, the very first episode of post brock settlement, we've got a uh, souterrain, uh, an underground structure built into the entrance of the brock at the very moment in time when the brock is out of use. Um, and not much more than that. That's the mystery. We don't have the immediate post brock Iron Age settlement. Of course, the answer to where it is might be that they're occupying still some of the buildings that surround the brock, even as the brock has gone out of use. But nevertheless, it is a bit perplexing that the first stage Immediately after the demise of the rock, when they pull it down, they reduce the height of the thing and fill it and pack it with rubble. The first thing they do is build a souterrain, an underground structure, which reuses the entrance of the rock. And that's quite odd, but very, very interesting. That's the, that's the inner end of the rock entrance. It's blocked up, it's sealed up entirely. And that wall that seals up the entrance creates an open space, uh, creates a space and uh, retains an open space in that passageway, that entrance passageway of the brock. And at the front of it, they hook up a, a curving passageway to that um, that connects to that chamber. And so it creates this underground passageway that does a dog line that turns into the entrance to the brock itself. Another view of it. Of course, it was roofed when we first excavated it, or mostly roofed when we first excavated it. And perched on that roof was a really interesting installation of a rotary querm, 
that's to say a, a grinding stone for grinding out grain and other materials and products, placed inverted, upside down, on top of another one, the lower stone is cut into quarters, the upper stone is broken in half, and then the two halves brought back to almost together, but kept apart with the insertion of a stone wedge. Some very strange practices going on here. And that quern was perched over a gap in the lintels of the roof of the souterrain, and we just, you just have to wonder exactly what's happening there. Is something being poured through that hole? Are there utterances being made? Is it communication? Uh, it's certainly not in situ grinding because the stones are broken and inverted. They're out of their working stance. So there's something very curious and interesting going on. This coming season, we'll see the, the final completion of the excavation of the citrain and the, the occupation materials or the floor deposits inside of it. And we hope to get a chemical trace of what may have been poured into there, if that's what's going on in that particular instance. And there's many examples of that, this kind of strange depositional practice at work on site. Another one is this. I won't go on for long about it. Just outside the front door of the brock, almost exactly the same time as the souterrain was constructed, there's a whalebone vessel placed against the outer wall face. Two left-sided red deer antlers are placed against it. A large saddle quern, an earlier slightly cruder form of quern grinding stone is rammed up against that whalebone vessel to really uh, position it into place and keep it there. Inside, it, inside that whalebone vessel, carved from the backbone of the whale, are two newborn lamb, lambs placed, a range of shellfish and fish and a human jawbone. of someone who we think is male, three out of four human remains specialists say male, one says maybe female. Genetics will get to the bottom of it eventually. Uh, almost toothless, just three teeth left. The rest of them have been resorbed. This individual's maybe in their 50s, but more likely a couple of decades older than that still, maybe even older than that. So not much age by today's standards, but by the standards of the Iron Age, probably a pretty long life. And it's part of a closure deposit, it's part of putting the brock to bed to lay this material out. And after they've laid out this curious assemblage of materials, they then covered it over very carefully with large pieces of stone and then brought lots more rubble down on top of it to seal it in forever, or until we got to it anyway. And it's not isolated. If it were isolated, you could, you could hum and haw about it till the cows come home. But the fact is, it's part of over 80 Fragmentary human remain depositions found in Orkney. 80 instances of this sort of thing have been found in Orkney alone, of semi-articulated or disarticulated human bone placed in conjunction with what appear to be significant deposits. Particularly around the entrances to Roundhouse. So this little schematic just brings together the data across Scotland, and you see how many of these deposits of fragmentary human remains come from um, entrance areas, the liminal zone, as it were. And then beyond that, beyond this post, this immediate post brock period, it's about another 150 years before we get the full on resumption of settlement, new forms of settlement being constructed. Curvilinear buildings, but in, but in the early stages in particular, rectilinear buildings, longhouses, avowedly different from the dominant architecture that's pertained previously, the big roundhouses. They're suddenly they're building these big long houses with mega halves like this huge one here, where the excavator there, our colleague James Moore, is actually sitting in one end of a half. But it's really quite monumental, two and a half to three metres long in its final uh, phase uh, iteration. So really substantial structure. And the Cairns is a bit odd because normally these post rock buildings get built around rocks. You know, late Iron Age into the Pictish period, they get arranged around the outside of rocks, um, sometimes using the masonry from the earlier Iron Age structures. At the Cairns, they're doing a weird thing. They're building into the, the built fabric of the rock. They're nibbling into it, actually biting into it, and putting the buildings in the, the, the areas that they've cleared and removed from the fabric of the rock itself or in some cases just building out over the infilled interior of the rock itself. So they really are stubbornly clinging <coughs> to this literal, this ancestral pile before them. 
And some of these buildings uh, from the later Iron Age period resemble things that we've seen before, in particular uh, the so-called Stalled building, which is the building in the centre here, <laughs> from excavated at the Howe. That's, that's a dead ringer almost for our structure B1 at the Cairns. Our structure B1 is about 100 years earlier than the suggested date for this building at the Howe. So around about 1800 <laughs> is when our structure B1 with that big mega half um, comes into life. And down at the far northern end of the site, off the slope of the brock itself, our structure K, which was originally, we think, a middle Iron Age building contemporary with the brock, it's unroofed at this point in time in 8300. It's a big structure with lots of space in it, but no longer. It's no longer roofed. It's filled up with rubble. And at about 8300, about the same time as that structure B1, they start doing metalworking in the building, just using the shelter of the structure itself. Um, oops, it's an escapee. And so we get fragments of pins, the metalwork itself. We get um, whetstones used for honing and polishing, burnishing <coughs> metalwork. We've got furnaces and the tweers, so that's the clay nozzles, the interface between the bellows or the blow pipes and the sides of the furnace themselves. We've got lots of nice moulds, a huge collection of moulds for casting objects, rings, pins, uh, brooches, lovely things, both the moulds and some of the products themselves. So you've got a, a ring pin mould there and the fragment of a ring pin there itself on the right. You've got moulds for casting decorated pins and, and they're all happening in the remains, the aftermath of this, post, this uh, Brock building. Another in situ shot of one there. That's a pin annual brooch, kind of lovely little cloak brooch that would have gathered together hems. More of them, over 60 of them all together, strewn across this area, around about 8300. There's some with pin shafts, some with hooped heads, ring head pins. That's a reconstruction of one, digitally um, cast and 3D printed in bronze for us by one of our master students. And that just gives a kind of sense of the that mass of metalwork in detritus from that period on site. Now, it's interesting enough, but the thing about it, it's also accompanied by over 15,000 uh, animal bones that seem to have been deposited in short order in a, a midden-like arrangement associated with the metalwork and just above and beyond and, and extending beyond the metalwork area itself. So what it looks like they're doing is feasting in a very, very big way in sharing out these metal objects, perhaps at least that's a fanciful interpretation at this stage, that what we're looking at is the actual birth of uh, these objects and them being launched into wider society. These pins, brooches and rings are almost certainly tokens of belonging, of identity, of membership of the group. There's probably a sponsor, maybe even in buildings like Structure B1 with its extravagant half, um, who are actually affording the wealth sponsoring the patrons bringing in metal workers to produce this stuff and then the finished items are being handed out at social events and occasions like this great feast handed out to those and such as those who are deemed to be deserving and so to that extent we're not just looking at objects and artifacts pretty things we're looking at potentially the glue that's binding together post brock iron age society that mechanism for bringing them together these objects are exchanged it's not, a, it's not a consumer market, it's not a, it's not a monetary economy. It's you show your status, your belonging, your deserving <coughs> through probably agricultural labour, but maybe also service in warfare and conflict as well. So I'm going to finish off, more or less. One of the things I like to think about is what does this all mean? As you would, as an archaeologist, you've got to sort of contemplate these things. <coughs> I hope, hopefully over the course of what we've been talking about, we've been sort of eking out some interpretations and meanings and significance as we've gone. One of the things that I find interesting is that in the midst of all this change, and I've only really summarised and very kind of crudely characterised the, the full detail of the change that's witnessed building to building, area of site to area of site, over the long period of centuries over which this site was occupied in Iron Age, and there's some really massive monumental changes, like that change from big roundhouses to much smaller, more delicate, but quite refined longhouses, and then other multicellular structures and 
real changes in architecture, but there's also stability, there's also things that run through that period, and sometimes they're the most unlikely looking things. So anyway, this is a radial carbon date to the site, and whilst that's a lovely smooth curve, so you've got the earliest dates at the top, and then as you come down in time, in fact into the Viking period, you've got quite a nice gentle curve. And that's the kind of curve that archaeologists and radial carbon dated interested persons like to see. We like to see that in the radio, the radio carbon dates because it suggests a nice smooth transition from time place to time period to time period, structure to structure, feature to feature. But really the statistical deviations mean there's lots of things going on in between these points of light brought about by radio carbon dating. There's, there is stability though as I say and sometimes in the most unlikely circumstances so we get lots of what we call animal bone groups on site little deposits, caches, if you will, of articulated animal bone. The kind of thing that was previously relatively ignored when excavators dug these things up. Ah, so what? It's a carcass of an animal. What does that possibly mean? When you actually look at the context of these things, though, they start to look as if they have a more significant pattern because at every moment of transition on the site, when they, when they close a building down and fill it up with midden and start a new building, there'll be an animal carcass or two or three laid out in, in those circumstances. When they modify a building and shrink it down and fill in one end of that building, they'll maybe put a few animal, animals, burials in that infill material. When they place a new hearth down, uh, they'll maybe put a red deer carcass like this one here, a semi-articulated juvenile red deer is placed under the hearth and under the paving that surrounded that hearth. And we see this again and again and again throughout the life of the site, from the earliest deposits that we've encountered on site so far through to the very latest. So overall, we've got about 17 or 18 of these animal bone groups. And in each case, there's one dominant animal largely represented as a whole carcass, and then two other animals of a different species placed with them. And that's remarkable because that kind of longevity and transmission of the same tradition of practice over hundreds and hundreds of years, despite all the swirl of changes and modifications that happen on site, this happens again and again and again and again. And one of the things I suppose it's tempting to think about is that in the midst of great change, in the midst of flux and massive monumental changes in people's lives, even when they themselves are responsible for those changes, you still need the security and the comfort of calling upon tradition. And, and the ceremonial ritual aspect of this is what we do under these circumstances when things are changing. We place these offerings, these votives, these deposits in this particular way and that's the way it's always been done. And it is tempted to think of that as a comfort in the face of great change. So that, that balance between massive change <coughs> and stability is something that I think is a sort of real keystone of, of human society, human culture, human behaviour around the world and really fascinated to see examples of it at the Cairns. So these pictures are really just pictures of the portions of these animals put back in to the sort of silhouettes of the animals they came from to evoke that sense of, of these foundation and decommissioning deposits. Very finally, of course, or almost finally, um, we're going to be digging again in this summer, in June and July. And so this story is only going to get richer and richer, more and more fulsome. You might already say, it's already too fulsome, Martin, shut up. But it is nevertheless a growing story. And so uh, we're going to be back there again for four weeks or five weeks, kind of, this summer, uh, working on site and enjoying ourselves in the lovely Orcadian summer weather. So if you get a chance to come down and join us, there's opportunities to join us to find the stuff. And there's just lots of opportunities for you to come down and visit our open site and uh, come and see what we're up to. So on that note, all that remains for me to do is put out the usual thank yous to everyone involved, which involves huge numbers of people, excavators, people that have helped, funding bodies, and in particular our landowners, Charlie and Yvonne Nichol Nicholson and their family and wider associates who've made our life not only tolerable and possible, actually incredibly enjoyable and rewarding as well. So they've been very good to us over the years. And I would just like to acknowledge them finally in my thank yous. So thank you. <laughs>